from 2005 and I'm now Director of Development and Communications at Garsington Opera, uh, an international uh, music festival just outside London. Um, over, over the last year uh, we have been faced with one of the largest challenges in perhaps a century uh, beyond anything that I could have imagined, certainly throwing a magnifying glass to systemic inequality, societal injustice, and with an horrific death toll to boot. Um, however, as the words that we all started to use almost every second sentence, furlough and lockdown become replaced with the words roadmap and double jabbed, it is now uh, a good time for us to reflect, although we're not out of the woods yet, I'm sure, uh, but to gather together some amazing people from Claire uh, to hear their own take on the experiences that they've had over the last year. So I'm very, very pleased to be joined by a terrific bunch of people. Uh, Catherine Hibbert, founder and director of Dot 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 Property, a social enterprise organization that combines property guardianship with community volunteer work. Andy Stone, head teacher at Holy Family Catholic Church and sixth form in Walthamstow. Shona Gibson, senior analyst at Tesco Supply Chain Development. And Stuart Murphy, CEO of English National Opera, based at the London Coliseum. Shona, may I start with you and uh, click back just over a year ago when I think for most of us, the first sign that something was awry was a real spate of panic buying and people running to the shops for things that really they didn't need to buy in bulk as a as an analyst how did what, what was that day at work like well um take me back to the first week of march last year and outside work people were starting to get anxious but we were still getting going to work as normal um inside work it was mad everyone's buying toilet rolls um why are they buying toilet rolls um and everything else and yeah essentially our ordering and forecasting system didn't quite know what to think um we've got we have a very intelligent system which knows how to forecast how many of everything is going to be bought in every shop of every product each day and it's pretty darn accurate normally um but it's trained to react to a little bit of yesterday and use a lot of what's happened in the past to predict tomorrow. It's what it's not trained to do is to say yesterday is the norm. Everything you've known in the past, just forget about it. The world changed overnight. And the problem is the world was changing overnight. And so essentially for a while we had to hand crank a lot of our automatic models because if you left them to themselves, they were going to tell us life was normal and life was, well, customers didn't think life was normal. It also led to some interesting trends. Um, the volume of to toilet rolls that you guys wanted was just more than our depots could actually cope with. Um, we were trying to pick more truck volumes than actually they could just manage in a day. We got extra staff in, we were using all of capacity volume, but it just wasn't enough. So it then became a balance of having to prioritise things that customers really wanted and actually let ourselves run out in store of some other things because it wasn't worth us um, bringing in enough of some speciality brand of pasta sauce to get the shelf full when actually our shelves were completely empty of beans so we just need to send half truck of beans. And if, if your algorithm responds on you know yesterday's data can you pivot that pretty quickly or, or were you finding that you were still having a lot of uh, very pricey pasta sauces being loaded onto trucks for the next week? Pretty quickly. Um, so we ordered we order about let's say 18 uh, no 36 hours out we tell the system um put this stock on a truck to end up in a shop in 36 hours and so by manual intervention we can do a 36 hour um timeline but after that we're pretty much done so for example if boris makes very if boris suddenly makes an announcement the next day the stores are screwed but we can affect it in two days time, which is something we did see in December. You'll remember the, was it Saturday the 19th of December? That announcement where the London and the Southeast just went, oh no, what's happened? 
because we'd just been told about the new variant and we really saw it in the sales for the Monday, um, which slightly screwed up our Christmas sales. Um, well, we might we might come back and okay. and talk about uh, you know how things have, have changed maybe and, and maybe some uh, you know changes that you put into that system to to mm. cope with these sorts of things in the future. But Andy, I, I just wanted to pick up on something that Shona said. You know, an algorithm looks at historic information and, and builds its its decision making on on you know a career of doing that. You you clearly you know you've been teaching for a long time your uh your you've been at your school for a long time did you did you find that everything changed overnight did your job completely change overnight it didn't completely change overnight and in truth it took us a little while to get to grips with with the new realities really so the first phase of lockdown the school stayed open in fact and the school has been open all, all through the year because we had to cater for vulnerable students and the children are key workers and so on but one of the um, tasks we had to do was provide remote learning for everybody else. And to begin with, it wasn't particularly good. We weren't geared up for it. Uh, so the staff themselves were not, uh, not able to deliver interactive lessons in the main. Some of them were the early adopters, but most of them weren't. And they were just setting work online and, and, and doing a sort of minimalist approach, really. But we also had difficulties that so many of our students, that a lot of them are from relatively deprived backgrounds, they don't have the technology at home, they didn't have the ICT kit available, their broadband might not have been working. So there were lots of those issues to, to deal with. But the other thing that the staff had to do last year, in following the announcement that exams were cancelled, was suddenly grade all the, all the students' work at GCSE and A-level. And, you know, that was a big ask. And then... An algorithm, as you'll recall, was part of that process and didn't do a terribly good job because, you know, the way it was set up meant that some students were, were going to receive harsher grades than they might have, you know, reasonably expected and so on. So, um, you know, algorithm's a dirty word in a school staff room, really. Um, and, we, you know, there was we were very glad when there was the the u-turn by the government and they said no we're going to go on the on the teacher assessed grades which we all felt well you, you know we could have done that in the first place and it would have all been fine um so a lot of things to get used to really um but yeah. by the time of the second lockdown we were much better set up for it all and what changed in, in in the way in which you interact with your students not not just thinking about the the platform perhaps or, or the environment that you're interacting with them but but the style of teaching did did you did you change the way that you interacted with with those pupils we, we found it um to begin with really difficult because students and particularly teenagers they're self-conscious uh, we had a policy of not having people's cameras on um and so you, you were talking to a to a blank you know equivalent of a zoom screen really it's not it's not great but people got much better at that and the students got uh, keener on on uh, on responding as well and we actually found some students really thrived in the remote learning environment they they actually preferred it a minority of students actually preferred learning that way um and and we're taking forward um, different ways of doing things, different pedagogical approaches based on what we learned from, from, re from remote learning. So a lot more resources are posted online. There's a lot more self-guided study support available to students. Um, and, you know, we, we can recognise we, we're very short on space and we've got an expanding sixth form. And we're going to be saying that some students next year will have a day at home because we can't cope with them all on site all the time. And they'll learn at home as part of the way that we do things in future. So, you know, that's quite an exciting development, really. Yeah. Well, let's come back to that. Uh, I want to ask Catherine, um, you know, thinking right back a, a year and a bit ago, um, your organisation is is very different to, to those others represented around the table, I think. Um, what specific challenges did you meet right at the very start? I mean, I think the biggest challenge that we had was moving from a business that's completely built on relationships, like it's completely built on having a positive and constructive relationship with the people that we house and making sure that they're taking good care of the building that they're living in. So our model, we place people who want to volunteer in buildings that would otherwise be empty. So like house sitting on a large scale, so they get cheap housing, they get support to volunteer, the building gets looked after, the community benefits, um, it's good value, flexible, 
um, reliable security for the property owner. So it's a it's a kind of win all round, but it's only a win if we're confident about who we're housing, how they're living in the buildings, how they're taking care of them. Um, and so, and not to mention the fact that of course they can't, every, all their volunteering opportunities disappeared overnight. So we had a real scramble to figure out how we were going to move from doing all, almost all of our work face to face really, to um, yeah, doing it online via Zoom and the like minimal health and, health and safety stuff, doing that safely in real life. Um, what was great was that the um, people that we house almost immediately found an amazing range of new things to get involved with that were clearly and tangibly helpful. So whether that was, um, you know, setting up the WhatsApp groups, putting out the notes with the like bit of paper to tear off to text the number to get put on a group to get some support. Like I think there was one, it was a terrible time. It was incredibly stressful, but I think that the speed with which people were like, okay, someone's got to sort this out. You know, there's people really struggling. What can I do? The speed with which that happened, not just among our guardians, but certainly among our guardians was really cheering. So, yeah. And do you feel that the, the, the community that you've built in, in person over so many years has, has been in some way strengthened by going through this together? Um, I couldn't honestly say that. No, I think in many ways it's been, I think it's been, um, I think it's been weakened. I think we need to be able to, we will not be able, to, we will have a, we have a task ahead of us to rebuild that, to get things back onto a good foot, footing. And I think we, you know, a year and two months ago, whatever it was, we underestimated how long that hangover was going to be. I think we're facing a year or 18 months to sort of rebuild all of that. What I would say, though, was that the, the work that we put in before paid off in spades. Like, I think the work that we put in before to make sure that people felt that they could pick up the phone when they had a problem, you know, if they were not able to um, pay their fees for where they were living, that they were able, we were able to have a conversation about that and figure out what they could pay rather than it just immediately becoming antagonistic and not a discussion. So I think it did show that, that you, the level of resilience you get from having relationships, which maybe aren't the most efficient in the short term, but actually, do help you to get through crises. So I think we need, we've got a task to get to get back there. But um, yeah, we were we were withdrawing pretty heavily from that bank of um, credit and good vibes and trust that we'd built up previously. I, I can imagine. I mean, I, I, as I said at the beginning, you know, I, I work in in classical music, and I I've witnessed that in my day to day. You know, really being able not to not to trade on on that, but really uh, benefiting from years and years of developing those relationships. And, and still, I wonder, you know, for an organisation like yours uh, that has built so many strong relationships with audiences and artists across many decades, um, how did it feel for you? Were you able to have a dialogue when everything hit last March? Um, I think it was a bit, as everyone else has said, it happened so quickly. It was, we just kind of went into crisis mode. I think, I can't remember the day that we closed, but um, we had the opening night, or we, we had, uh, we'd had two performances, I think. I know one performance of the Marriage of Figaro, a kind of new production, went down really well. And we were about to have the second performance and I got all the company in the theatre before and said, we think it's going to be fine. We're just going to keep going until we hear otherwise. And um, we did the second performance the day after. We were about to do the dress rehearsal of uh, an opera called Rosalka. It had been about two years in, in the making. And then I think about four o'clock, um, Alex, who runs the Royal Opera, who is the chief executive of the Royal Opera House, phoned me and said, we're going to close. What are you going to do? I was like, I'm pretty sure we're going to close as well. So, and then I think within about the space of an hour, um, about 10 arts organisations all said, actually, we're closing, go home right now. Um, There's a really odd sense, I don't know if the rest of the panel felt it, but because it was such an unknown, 
I, I think people had no idea whether public transport was going to stop, whether people were going to be closed inside their houses. Um, you know, I, my big worry was, is this going to be like bird flu? And straight away, you think of your parents, you know, my parents are in Leeds, I'm in Sussex and London. Um, so, you know, my my main priority was just get everyone out of the building and get everyone home. Um, I think also, you know, perhaps I'm different to other people on the panel, I don't know, that um, in the sense that everyone who works in an opera company is kind of hired to be emotional. And, you know, if you do any kind of Myers-Briggs tests or personality tests, everyone ends up in one corner. You know, everyone is really, really kind of emotionally raw and um, and paid to express all the time. And so and they're at their best when they do that. And so it was really strange because I'm relatively new to opera. I used to work in TV and, um, you know, trying to make sure everyone was really calm and rational and processional in their thinking and just got everyone home in one piece. Um, and then it was almost a relief because, um, you know, there's a small team of us f fortuitously we'd all got on Facebook workplace, a kind of internal communication system about two months before. Um, and that transition had been slightly bumpy because, um, Again, an opera company, kind of unlike other companies, I think, that have 10% specialists, 90% generalists. An opera company kind of has 90% specialists of, you know, opera singers, classical musicians, set designers, uh, marketers, and only kind of 10% generalists. And everyone kind of speaks a different language. It's like the seven tribes of Game of Thrones. And, um, and but the moment lockdown hit, everyone got on Facebook workplace and people had no choice but to speak exactly the same language and um, and be in the same space. So, you know, as Catherine says, it was a really awful time, but there were absolutely some beneficial things happened as a result of it. And staying with you, Stuart, you know, I think it's fair to say that with every crisis comes an opportunity. And and just from from my vantage point within the same industry as you, seeing what ENO and you have managed to do, innovating in in a time where that that is really even harder than it is in normal times. Um, can I ask you? Did did you did you draw? Uh, did you immediately think, okay, you know, I've been in TV. We're all going online. This is ideal. I know exactly what I'm doing, and this is what I'm going to do. How did how did that go? So when when I moved from TV to the opera world, you know, the, the kind of the opera critics went into meltdown. How dare an ordinary person who's not kind of brought up in opera for forty years possibly understand this incredibly specialist and difficult medium? Forgetting the fact that Tony Hall had gone from the BBC to the Royal Opera House, and um, and there were lots of kind of things in opera that that are signs saying keep out. You know, they use words like um, zitzprobe instead of rehearsal. They say toy 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 instead of uh, good luck, and so kind of lots of signs that prevent people feeling it's an accessible genre. Um, and I couldn't understand what all the fuss was about. I thought it's just like running, basically like running any large group of gifted people, you know, it's got its, its challenges, but actually I kind of got this. Um, and and so uh, not that other people worked in kind of high pressure situations in, in say if I freeze in a ridiculous thing, can you take a photo and send it to me? Um, and um, so we got down to a really small management team and then we said, OK, there's three things we're going to do, which is um, we're going to survive this financially. Um, we're going to keep producing work and we're going to keep our people informed every step of the way. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess it was an opportunity because it allowed us to reinvent what opera means for our audience at a pace that we probably wouldn't have been given license to had we not been in lockdown because people suddenly all art stopped basically and went online and opera i think of all the art forms is really difficult to um enjoy on a small screen um so we thought how can we um you know reimagine what opera is and so we did a drive-in opera at alexandra palace in london it was handy because you're in a car, so, you know, you can't kind of get infected. Um, we did a socially distanced performance of Mozart's Requiem in the theatre, and we just done Handel's Messiah, a shorter version, and um, and then paired up with the NHS to do a big kind of breathing 
um, a, a breathing program for people who've had, who have long COVID just to give them confidence in their breathing again. So yeah, it gave us lots and lots of opportunities. But I'm in awe of other people on this panel and other people in the arts who, who you know, Britain is just full of brilliant, quirky thinking people. And it was really inspiring seeing what came out of a crisis. I thought, you know, I, I was saying to uh, my, my kids, I think as a country, we can be pretty proud of ourselves. We didn't descend into civil, civil disobedience. People kept being strong and community came to the fore. And I think even though there's an appalling death rate that's way out of kilter with what it should be, should be, but you know, it's an appalling death rate in Britain. I think in loads of other senses, I think we can be pretty proud of how we coped. Yeah, I mean, thank you, Stuart. We've we've had a few questions uh, posted in for those watching live, and so I'll I'll start to feed them into the discussion as as we go. But if anybody uh, would like to contribute further, please do put your questions in the chat. But Andy, I'd like to come to you. I had a question from Claire saying how Stuart mentions about everyone being kept on board and that everyone benefits as a result. Do you feel the same has been possible in schools? Um, and she asks this as a teacher herself. Uh, we, we invested a lot about, about, as Stuart said, keeping everybody informed. Um, I, I started off doing a, I called it a CV update that I would email around. I'm still calling it that. It, it's, um, it was something that might have gone out three, four times a week. It usually goes out a couple of times a week now. And we tried to make sure that everybody was included, that we, um, we, we celebrated uh, successes as, as we saw them that we we kept a sense of community going I think that was really important and people really appreciated that and we had a lot of anxiety I've got a very diverse staff as well and there was a lot of concern about the differential consequences of COVID uh, on ethnic minorities um, and it, there was a lot of reassurance needed and there was I, I think one of the things I'm really proud of and I agree with Stuart I think the country's coped really well and, and many sectors have coped really really well was the resilience of, uh, of our staff and young people, the, the flexibility of people to, to rise to a challenge and to learn new skills really quickly. And, you know, just a fantastic commitment from our staff um, to, to want to do, to do the best that they can for, for all the young people that we serve. And perhaps a greater awareness as well of some of the challenges that some families were facing, because things like, you know, have you, have you got enough kit? I don't know how many digital devices I've, I've got in my house, but, you know, quite a few. I don't have issues with broadband. Well, not, not too often since I moved from BT. And, um, you know, it, it, but some people really, really struggle. It's a, it's a massive problem for them. Um, and when you've got, you know, it, it, the government would glibly say, well, you know, schools are providing online learning. But if you've got three kids um, and they're all wanting the same laptop and then your, your broadband's not very good, it was really, really challenging. So the way that people came together and, and were um, keen to volunteer their time and, and go the extra mile was really impressive. And the kids' resilience, I mean, you know, kids, uh, kids are amazing. Of, of course they are. And, and as we say, we've got great talent in this country, but they show, they've shown great resilience. And most, most children, so, some unfortunately, have really, really struggled during the pandemic and their, their mental health has really suffered. But most of them have coped really well. Um, and they've been able to adapt to online learning. They've been able to adapt to new ways of, of having to do things. And they've also been really, really happy coming back to school and just being kids. It's been great to see them playing just in the playground and just running around and, you know, being daft and silly and, and, and just doing the things that kids do again. So that's what we tried to do was to, to, to hope that, that everybody would feel part of a community that cared about them. And I think that was a big success for us in our school and something I'm, I'm most proud of, I think, as, as a school leader, really. I can imagine. Shona, I just want to come back to you and pick up on something Stuart was talking about uh, around innovating, you know, time to, to ring the changes on some things that have been done the same way for a long time. I'm, I'm imagining this, but I, I, I imagine that your role, you're constantly tinkering with something that's been going on to improve. But, but is this the first time that you've had to, or did you in fact have to do a complete overhaul of, of the system to make it fit for purpose again? Oh, interesting question. Um, I think in a way, it, it's almost been like we've done a set of COVID tinkers 
rather than just our normal we're always doing tinkers with it which is about taking us from 98 percent accuracy to 99 percent accuracy but um instead of so a one we would have been i don't know 90 percent accurate instead of 98 suddenly due to the changes um and so we've had to do some extra tinkers one of which has been around the weekly shape of trade so quick way of summing it up is that pre-covid um your sales shape for the week looked like that and then a peak then you go more on friday big peak on saturday much less on sunday because people want stock up at the weekend and you're generally not free to go shopping during the week we saw a big flattening out of that from last march because people are not out at work five days can only go shopping on saturday and um think people thinking of right i'm going to do one big weekly shop but i want to make sure i don't meet other people so i'm going to try and time it when someone else isn't um so we essentially had to retune our system to come up with a shape like that and also it changed a few times over the years and not at the normal times when we'd expect it to change um essentially it tended to change with boris making big cha big changes to things so when we went back into lockdown um in november um when some of the significant relaxations were announced that kind of thing interesting and we've also had a question from anthony davis which which i think is is really drawing on the fact that i, I suppose we're, we're we all kind of uh, exhibit shoal or herd mentality and he's asking whether those that uh, that were that were promoting the fact that they were panic buying were they in fact showing an element of of being able to to mold big data um do, do you think that there were some outliers of the shoal leading us all from a data point of view i don't think i have much more wisdom on it than you could guess from the general population but just thinking about it um the need to panic by toilet roll was completely stupid um there was people are always going to have there's always going to be enough toilet roll um and one thing we did see is that toilet roll sales in april may last year were much lower than the previous years so i've got a graph here which is sales by week across the whole of 2019 and 2020 of toilet roll you see the massive spike in march above what it was in 2019 and then actually late in the next two months you see the rates being less than they were and to me that's the there was always enough toilet roll around and people didn't need any more um and so the panic buy was just a bit stupid um but i can see that because one person did it everyone else thinks you need to do it too I think possibly what we're looking at there is the term influencer, but I'm not going to get into that. Um, yeah. Catherine, I do. I want. To, I want to come back to you and and draw on a question that Nick has asked about eureka moments. Um, have you found that you've run into problems that you you perhaps will continue to run into after the pandemic that you you've now cracked and that you you'll keep the solution to that going long after this is in the rearview mirror? I mean, I think I'm. Like there's not like this is not exceptional to dot dot dot, but I think that the getting used to doing doing things like this by video has been an absolute revolution. And yes, it's you, you need you need to do it. You need to do face to face as well. But I think that the just the the, the level of inclusiveness you can achieve when people can work from home more, when people can come and check out the properties that we've got from their front room you know i think we are always really keen to make sure we're re reaching like a broad group of people to see what we what we've got and actually if what you're doing is you know normally we used to have our viewings at 6 p.m like that if you can't make that you ca you can't be housed by us in the old world we sometimes would have them at weekends but where we, we get much better attendance at our viewings doing them online i think people can just test the water, check it out, um, it's less of a commitment. And I, I think the, you know, panel events like this, are ex it's very similar, like you, um, you know, you, you don't have to go all the way to Cambridge to um, 
hear the conversation and you can you know make your dinner while you're listening um and I think that's but you know I, we're not alone in that but um I think it has just shown that it was never necessary to be face to face as much and particularly for people who've got families I don't know I realize homeschooling and working on zoom is, is not great but I think once you know now the schools are back um I think that's going to be really transformative and I think it's going to mean that we can employ and house a much wider range of people than we previously could which is great. Perhaps you could just outline the the volunteering element um of of your business model if I can call it a business if I can call it business if that's how you would it refer to it yeah, yeah. um but but also how the digital domain and and the prevalence of us all being on zoom might have changed the opportunities for volunteering for for those guardians that you have. Yeah, so um, yeah, I started dot 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 because um, it was really clear that where you've got empty buildings and if you can turn them into inexpensive housing, being able to give someone a house for a third or a half of their local market rent revolutionizes their life. So, but we can't house people who are vulnerable, who are going through challenges, who are going through difficulties because they have a duty to look after the building that they're living in. They need to be able to rely on them to move out properly when the building needs to go back that kind of thing so we're in the situation where we've got this cheap housing that we can't allocate by need regrettably so i decided it would be good to give that housing to people who are going to use the space that just having a slightly less expensive life gives you to do something useful so we exist to we are happy to house anyone who does any kind of volunteering for any charitable purpose so the charitable purposes as defined by the charities commission are very broad uh, it's basically anything you can think of that's good for society whether it's through the environment sport arts communities whatever it is um so everyone that we house commits to giving at least 16 hours a month to a good cause as defined by the charities commission of their choice and we do it like that because I think it's best, you know, individuals have a better idea of where their skills are, what they're going to be excited to do, what's actually useful, like what is going to have an impact that they care about. And that's, I think, much better. And the, the things that they come up with to do are so much more diverse and varied than we could possibly source ourselves. Although we do source things, if people are stuck, we'll point them towards things we know are good and they'll definitely be able to be useful and enjoy it. Um, but I think actually the volunteering that people have been doing virtually has always been really powerful and exciting. So for a couple of examples, um, we've got um, several guardians who are like pen pals for people who are dealing with cancer. And you, you know what it's like when you're, when you're re feeling really poorly, like getting a letter, if poor, poorly and isolated, getting a letter through your door is so, so much better than getting a in the right circumstances, so much better than getting a phone call or a visit or an email because there's something about getting a letter and it's, you don't have to you don't have to be in good form to respond to it. You just, just receive it. So, so people doing that, of course, you can do that from home. We've also got people who, got several people who do this thing, I have to look up what it's called, but basically you making, translating satellite images into real maps in the developing world for emergency services. So again, you can just sit in your room doing that and being, you know, it's really, it's really useful thing. Um, yeah, so, so I think there's always been that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, I think a lot of what our guardians has been doing have been out there in the, in the real world, because of course, most of the people that we house are quite young or on the younger side and, you know are fairly healthy so quite a lot of what they've been doing has been the food banks you know they're doing like prescription runs for elderly people and um, there's a really awesome char charity charity social enterprise called good gym which i don't know if you've come across but basically it's exercise plus doing good so you run to where there's some good you can do you do that good which is probably like physical or, or chatting with someone and then you run home so it motivates you to go for your run and you've helped someone and the amount of the amount of of, of things that they those guys have been doing taking advantage of the fact that they are young and healthy so they can get out there and you know 
do the stuff that the people who are older or more housebound can't do. Um, Just yeah. speaking from my own my own personal experience of, of starting to volunteer perhaps more seriously than I had ever before, I hope, and I wonder if you would agree with this statement, I hope that it's something that's here to stay that those that have suddenly found a way of contributing to their society, perhaps a community they, they weren't really part of before, thinking about a metropolis, you know, sometimes you don't even know your neighbour, but we've we've come together a bit more. Do you feel that? Yeah, well, I think it's like a lot of, I think volunteering is like a lot of things where um, you want, you know, you'd be good, to, you know, it'd be good to do it. You know, you'd, you'd probably enjoy it. You'd probably get something out of it, but do you actually, you know, it's the same as, it's the, I always think it's exactly the same as going to the gym. You know it'd be good. You'd be a better person if you did it. You'd probably enjoy it once you were doing it. Do you actually put on your leggings and go and go for that jog or whatever? You know, fairly often no. But once you've started and once you've got the routine and people are expecting you to turn up and you, you know, you people will be disappointed. You know, they'll be sorry when you're not there and you know you're doing something useful you know, that, that's what motivates you to be, you know, the volunteering equivalent of like putting on your trainers and going out for that jog. And it, like, it's, it's not a, pan we don't have like pandemic specific data on this at dot, dot, dot. But we, we do know from all the Gar guardians that about 45% um, of people who, when they join us are, are not currently volunteering. So they're not, they say that they want to volunteer, but they're not currently volunteering. But 98% of our guardians say they'll carry on volunteering after they're not housed with us. So, you know, we do breathe down their necks. We do expect them to do it. It's part of what they've signed up for. But I think that's, that shows you that once you get started, you actually, you get really into it. We've got, you know, for example, we've got a, we work in High Wycombe. We've got a guy who's a bricklayer. He volunteers at the like St. Tiggy Winkles Animal Hospital. You know, it's the most incongruous thing, but, he loves it and you know you have photos of him like with a little wounded duck or whatever um and i think once you what i'm saying is once you get started the momentum stays with you and i hope we'll see that happening yeah across the board i think the timing of the lockdown you know when you kind of look back it was britain felt so divided after brexit you know so many articles about families refusing or not being able to speak to one another then you look at the political parties you know the conservative party spelt felt pretty split um, after the election of leader, as did the Labour Party, you know, this, we weren't a kind of coherent nation and with devolution and all the different challenges around the UK, it felt like families were kind of pitted against one another a bit. And then, you know, for me, it was the kind of Thursday night clap, which felt so British. And then when it was people banging pots and pans, it was just you know, while it was for a great cause, it was also really silly and ridiculous and seeing your neighbours in sort of slippers and, um, and you know, Britain is great when we're slightly rubbish and doing something a bit daft, even though it's for a really good cause. Um, you know, it'd been a while since we'd had a sporting event that the whole country could um, coalesce around. And so, you know, for me, it was the Thursdays got people thinking differently. And then there were big things that were unifying. Obviously, there was Zoom, but you know, I think Captain Tom wasn't just about Captain Tom. It was a, a moment that everyone could come together over. Um, you know, I think um, people have got a, a deeper appreciation of nature. I think also at the start of lockdown, there were one or two really key shows that brought the nation together on TV, um, you know, with, um, oh, on, you know, the thing on BBC Three now that I've completely forgotten, the love relationship between the Irish lad and the British girl. Why have I just forgotten? Oh, uh, normal people. Normal people, yes. Yeah. So I think normal people was a huge thing, like, uh, like um, Line of Duty is at the moment and Strictly Come Dancing, but so, so it kind of makes sense that people are coming together a bit more and, you know, the heat is coming out of the country a bit um, uh, as people got behind the NHS and, you know, community. I think, I do think that's true. I think, I think that is, that's the, that's the trend that's going against the fact that people are, I think there is an element of the like curtain twitching and like who's doing what and like, why are you out when you, you know, I, I do, I do think that I, I, I agree with you, Stuart. I think that's been the really cheering side of it, but I think there has also been, um, I think people are quite in the, with the level of like health anxiety that people have. Mm. I think it is difficult. I think there is, we need as much of that as we can, because I think there's also the, why is everyone on the beat? Why is everyone in the parks? Why are these people going to the seaside? Like, 
Definitely a split between, yeah, I, th I think you're right. There's definitely a split, isn't there, between younger or younger people and, and everyone else. They kind of, uh, you know, the kind of reckless abandon they approach drinking. I mean, although I don't know why we're all talking about Are you talking about, about the old people? Because I, I think <laughs> the young people hardly drink anymore. The, uh, <laughs> everyone's <laughs> given up. And Shona knows exactly who's drinking. So we'll come back to that. Andy, yeah. I, I just want to come to you. Uh, we, we've spoken about first reactions uh, and immediate pivoting and, and innovation and, and things that have, in a way, got us through this year uh, in terms of the navigation of this crisis. But there is a long way still to go. And, and I said at the, at the start, and you've, you've also raised as well, you know, the systemic inequality that has been really magnified by this. Um, thinking about that, and, and also you, you touched on the, the grading as well. Um, do you feel that there's now a time and, and a place for, for reform? I do. It's one of, it's one of the, the, the passionate interests I have. I think the, the education system, uh, had become a bit stale, a great focus on, on exams, a great focus on, on GCSEs, which are an exam that derived from O-levels, which was something you took when you were 16 at a time when many people left school and started, a, start, started their employment uh, and career. And really all, all GCSEs do now is decide what A-levels you can do, in fact, whether you can do A-levels or not. So I, I would like to see um, for teachers who, who've demonstrated that we can assess students fairly and rigorously, I'd like to see a, a step away from um, the huge emphasis on, on examinations because it kills the joy of learning. And year 11 becomes, a, well, not, you know, how do I enjoy this poem in English literature? It's, it's how do I pick up marks according to the mark scheme? And you get this kind of, you know, writing answers by numbers almost, which takes away a lot of creativity. Similarly, we had that sort of you know, the, the English baccalaureate idea of Michael Gove and that, you know, detracted from students who wanted to study creative arts subjects and so on. So I, th I think there's, there's a moment for reform there. But I wanted to pick up on, on, on the conversation that's been going on about things that have, have become different, because we've seen a great interest in decolonizing the curriculum. Um, we've seen with you know, during the pandemic, during the first lockdown, we had the awful death of George Floyd. We also then saw the Black Lives Matter movement and we saw, um, you know, um, Edward Colston, isn't it, in Bristol and his statue being chucked in the harbour. And it really engaged a lot of our young people. And so there's a, there's a, a great interest. Something that we've been doing is looking at every single subject led by, um, by our history department, but looking at how we make the curriculum more inclusive more diverse, more relevant to 21st century Britain. And that's been a really interesting um, project. And it's really engaged some of our young people as well in, in that narrative and that, and that story. And I think that's really, really important. So I think there have been these positives that have come out of it. I think as well, you know, we have seen this coming together in some respects. And in, in some ways, I heard somebody say the other day on the radio, you know, maybe David Cameron's big society is finally coming to fruition, you know, 11 years after he was he was first elected. But um, I don't know about that. But um, and I don't know how long it will last and how how deep the roots are of this greater community mindedness. But that's something that we want to to see in our school. And I would like to see in the education system that's something that's, you know, that we have a, a, a truly liberal holistic approach to, to how we educate our young people. I think it's become very kind of, you know, uh, instrumental and we must do this. What, what, what's the benefit of doing this and how will this get me a job and how will this benefit the economy and so on? And I don't think it needs to be that way. So I think there's a moment for us. But, you know, unfortunately, we, we don't have the political leadership to drive that forward at the moment. But it's something that's certainly happening uh, from a, a bottom level up, I think. You know? Yeah. I, I think I, I can see that even in, in the, the part of the world that the, the industry that I work in. And Stuart, we've had a question from Claire to, to, or a statement really, but, uh, but saying that, you know, whilst there have been many wonderful things of coming together, there are people who are in a really difficult position, devastated and traumatised. And I know from uh, hearing about your work and, and your organisation that um, ENO Breathe is in some way trying to, to meet people in that. Can you tell us a bit about that? 
Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I saw Claire's comment. Yeah, God, of course. You know, what is, what's the latest figure? One hundred twenty-five thousand people have died, and you know, what I thought was fascinating was people have talked about a K-shaped recovery. So those who are in predominantly predominantly in public services or pretty rich or middle middle class to start with will do better, and those who are poor will actually do a lot poorer, and the recovery will be a K-shaped thing. So you know, maybe we're about to go into an even more divisive period coming out of lockdown. Um, yeah, Ian you know, breathed so. I'm, I'm fascinated by probably from working, you know, in my previous career when I worked in TV, I'm fascinated by projects that on, on the surface pretend to be about one thing, but actually fundamentally about something else. Um, so the, the, the example everyone uses in TV is Antiques Roadshow is never about the antiques, it's about human greed. And the moment the producers realised that, then all the shots were of people's responses to how much something was worth. Another example people say is, you know, the X Factor isn't about singing. Of course it's not. It's about uh, mainly working class Britain's belief that um, a simple moment can transform their lives, like the lottery. The, the great one I love is Great British Bake Off. It's not really about baking. It's about trying to throw back to a Britain that never really existed which is why there's the bunting, which is why there's the marquees, the gentle jokes. Um, anyway, so so I love that. I find it fascinating. And certainly in my previous career, the moment you realise what the fundamental truth is about a TV show, that's when it goes crazy big. Anyway, um, with when you know in in the in lockdown we were trying to work out how you become an important and how you, you stay an important and relevant artist organization you know an opera isn't known for its uh, accessibility and so you know it was really important to us that we um we didn't just put archive content over zoom um, <clears throat> uh, we thought actually, because that's trying to replicate the live experience, which is really hard to do. Um, we said instead, let's make sure our answer to the kind of digital problem is to uh, have conversations over Zoom with all our members, because really it should, shouldn't be about operatic content, it should be about friendship and community. And the moment we realised that, then our offer of a digital was really different. And that then led us into thinking, how can we matter to people who don't care about opera? And the biggest wor one of the biggest worries for people was how to breathe when they'd had COVID. And I th I'm sure, I'm, I imagine there are lots of medics on the Zoom, because Claire always had strong <laughs> medics. That um, you know, that feels like a huge time bomb in Britain to me. The long COVID issue. I think is it one in eight have got long COVID, um, and some of my mates do. And um, and so we said, actually, we this is where we you know we're experts. We know how to train people to breathe deeply from the diaphragm, not just surface breathing. We know how how to help people be present in their body, and for people who aren't into opera, you know, when you sing, you use your whole body as a kind of amplifier to resonate the sound. And so, we um, did a trial with um, we, we contacted Imperial College um, uh, NHS Healthcare Trust, um, and Sarah, Professor Sarah Elkin said, "Yeah, we'd quite like to do a pilot." We did a pilot with ten people. Um, it was really, really worked. And then Matt Hancock, who'd been culture secretary and obviously now secretary of state for health, was really interested. And him and Oliver Dowden and the NHS supercharged it. So we've rolled it out across the country. We've got, I think, a thousand people taking part. Um, it's been on, you know, Good Morning America. It's been in China Daily and Australia. And fingers crossed, we'll roll it out across the world, but charge people. <laughs> so it's, you know, free for Big Blue Britain, but we'll just sting the foreigners if there are any on zoom um and yeah it's been good um so we don't teach people how to sing we teach people to get their breathing confidence back again by doing a series of um sort of techniques some of it's alexander technique some of it's um just deep breathing technique and what's been great is it's meant we've started to matter to people who whose idea of sitting in a theatre for a three hour opera is hell. And so now people are talking, oh, I really love e &O. We're not having to have people's view of e &O mediated through a small cabal of eight opera critics, which is good. I think I've gone quite dark suddenly, haven't I? Both. Um, you, you still look good. You still look good, Stuart. Don't, don't worry. But um, I think everything you've just said really resonates uh, with 
with my experience and I'm sure other panelists too, you know, just any amount of good breathing and physical movement and community, I think that's a really potent cocktail. And, and I'm sure that many of those that are indeed devastated and traumatized following having contracted the, the virus and having long COVID, I'm sure they're really benefiting from that. I think that's um, a really weird thing with, oh, sorry, Johnny, sorry. No, no, I go think, on, go on. I was just going to say, I think that's another really weird thing with lockdown. You know, when we weren't in lockdown, lots of people had a kind of half hour or one hour commute to work where you got in work mode. Then when you finished work, you came back and got into home mode and a home outfit. Um, and you were pretty active at work. If you were in a meeting, you could read people's body language. And there was a kind of rhythm to a physical conversation that we just don't have now on Zoom. If there's a silence for a millisecond on Zoom, someone wants to fill it. We sit all day, I eat everything that's not, that's even remotely edible in the house. And um, and then, you know, it's not like working from home, it's it's like living at work. You know, you've got no decompression moment and, and everyone's wearing jogging pants or naked as I am from the waist down. <laughs> Well, we'll maybe leave that to, to the uh, to the end question. See if anyone wants to see that proven. Uh, Shona, I just want to come back to you. You know, we've been talking about uh, learning points and uh, elements of of trying to close the the gaps in in our society. And uh, I suppose my question to you, may, maybe this is this is actually not something that that you particularly think about in your day to day. But my question to you is: in your role, looking at data of, of what we all do and what we all buy are there are there sort of moral choices that you can make around the work that you do and uh, is there long-term change that you consider beyond the most efficient way of doing the algorithm or you know of, of doing that process hmm interesting one um there are certainly some choices like that which i think are not within the supply chain team but rather within the commercial team so things so decisions we've made as a business like um not promoting a uh, sugary things on checkouts um and taking promotions off kids fizzy drinks things like that um that i suppose you we could incite people to buy more of unhealthy things or make it easier for them to buy healthy things i have to admit that's not something that's with a, within our supply chains remit um but there is an immense amount that you can do in surveying the data to see what people are doing um that i think can help inform healthy outcomes in other directions um and it's, it's i suppose about how much we can share the data that we have that, that makes sense. And I, I was struck as well, I think, it, around the time that uh, supermarkets were prioritising people uh, you know, to get access to the shelves right in the morning. I, you know, I think now we, we see that as a, a, a very obvious and necessary step. But at the time, I was I was pleasantly surprised that the the national brands of supermarkets mm -hmm. were were socially minded in that way, uh, rather than just trying to get as many people through the doors as possible. Did 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 that have any effect on your work? Um, it didn't have any effect on our work as such because, for example, the elderly shopping hour, we expected to get the same volume of people through the store in that day and our team essentially thinking day units for everything. Um, but yes, likewise, I think when we heard about that, it was really nice that the people on high in Tesco weren't just thinking about Profits. they were also thinking about what's the right thing to do for the company and I think we've seen that in several things this year um, for example immediately all of our so all of our shielding staff were told in March go home stay at home you're on full pay and so they were given full pay through the whole time and actually told to stay at home and there's been various I can't remember the exact details, but essentially various people whom in other industries might have been on very low pay or been really pressurised to come back to, to work have been told, please don't come to work, we're paying you. Um, and that's been a really yeah. nice thing to come from the business. Um, yeah. 
I think possibly uh, we've we've lost Shona at the end of her sentence. So I'm going to nip in here just in the closing moments of our session. And Andy, I, I want to come back to you. We've had a couple of questions um, specifically around uh, funding of music in schools, um, something that I care about a lot, but I'd, I'd be interested to hear whether you feel that there's been a particular um, impact on that, first of all. There's, there's been a particular impact, not from, from lack of funding as such, but just from it's been one of the most difficult things to deliver remotely. So you can do kind of music appreciation, but actually having a go and using instruments and learning an instrument, that's been much more difficult. So, um, yeah, we've got some work to do with, with bringing music back up. And we've, we've noticed year nine students choosing their options. Fewer of them this year are choosing music as a GCSE subject, which is a, a bit disappointing. And the, the second point was was around teenagers who, of yeah, course, yeah. are in the best years of their lives, <laughs> I'm sure. It, it's funny because it, a lot of them are incredibly stoical and they're, they're not kind of going around feeling really cheesed off and, and hard done by. A lot of them have been really concerned about their, their, their older relatives and particularly students who live with older relatives. They've been really concerned about coming in and then possibly infecting a, a grandmother or a grandfather or something like that. So they, they haven't been. I think that the, the age group I, I feel worse for is our students who left last year to go to university this year. Because I, I don't really know how it's been at Clare. But, you know, from what I've heard of other students who, who've gone to different places, it's not been a great experience. It's been a disappointing first year at university. So if there's a particular cohort I feel really sorry for, it's that cohort and, and the ones in the second or third year at university who I think have had a, a, a really disrupted time um and, and you know probably do feel hard done by i've got one who's in the second year at pembroke in cambridge at the moment and they just seem to have drunk their way through it as far as i can tell <laughs> <laughs> well uh, as as we close our session um i want to ask each of you the same question um and uh i, I wonder if possible to to ask you a, a question that i i wonder if you can have a short answer to but Stuart, i'm going to start with you um what do you hope for in the next year for all of us what's your hope oh, <laughs> I mean, that's what you forgot <clears throat> what to hope for um oh blimey um i hope we have a kinder society um and i hope we are more prepared when this happens again as i think it probably will in our lifetime several times um uh, and I hope we, yeah, I hope as a society we know that people judge us by how we care for the most vulnerable and, um, and not just how we exalt people who are rich or the richest, I guess. And um, Catherine, what, what are your hopes um, for the foreseeable future? Uh, I mean, I guess I think that it's the nature of bad things happening to you that they actually take much longer to recover from than you anticipate. And I think, you know, m many of us have been bereaved, we're grieving, um, we've, you know, bad things have happened. And I think what, if there's one thing I know about that, it's that the acute phase is one thing, the chronic phase is another thing. And like, I think it just, I really hope that we can maintain some, you know, as much solidarity, as much tolerance, as much um, focus on what's really important through that recovery phase, rather than everyone's being like, oh, right, we're all jabbed, let's get back to it, stop the whinging. You know, like what we need to acknowledge just how long it's gonna take to recover. And yes, there have been good things coming out of it, but yeah, I think individually and on a social scale, probably we all just need to give ourselves a little, <laughs> chance to kind of yeah recover absolutely and, and use and it as an opportunity to become more resilient for exactly the reasons that Stuart said you know it won't be the last and um yeah using shocks to make you notice where you could be more resilient yeah is, Shona uh, do you have a hope for us uh, I'm so sorry I'm going to ask you to unmute Thank you. That was always going to happen. Um, from a supermarket point of view, I think some people have 
um, maybe changed their diets or just made a point of taking more time to do um, proper cooking this year. And it would be great that we could have, that the nation's health might have changed, who knows. Um, and I think also that a lot of us have got used to a more working from home lifestyle, um, which is allows for a bit more family time, a bit more flexibility, a bit more time to go out and have some exercise during the day. And my team, I think, have adopted that really healthily. Um, we're almost encouraged to take a two hour lunch break and go out and have some fresh air if that's what we want to do. Um, and that as a nation, we might have taken that approach. Yeah. And Andy, if we haven't covered every hope in the world just yet, uh, what would be yours? We've seen more people apply for vacancies with us than uh, dramatically more this year than in previous years. So I hope that that continues. And I also hope that we have, we, we've seen a newfound trust and respect for the teaching profession. And I think, I, I hope that that continues really, because, you know, by and large, teachers work really, really hard. Um, and, and it's a difficult job at times. It's a challenging job. It's a very rewarding job, but they deserve to be you know, held in, in high regard by, by society. And I think we've seen some improvement in that. And I, I hope that continues. Well, I hope that we can do this in person at some point. Catherine, I think you made a good point that it's great we don't all have to go to Cambridge, but wouldn't it be nice to go to Cambridge? Um, <laughs> and I'm just extremely grateful uh, to you all for your time and for your insights this evening. It's been fascinating talking about um, each of your successes and your journeys through what's been an extremely turbulent and very distressing time for many, uh, and to hear your learning points um, of, of what you've experienced. And I certainly wish you all the very best in your endeavours in the in the near future until we can meet again but um as we sign off thank you to everybody who joined us uh, thank you to the team at claire as well for putting this together and for inviting us to participate it's been great fun and uh the in person might have to wait just a little bit longer you will have seen in your inbox uh the latest email sharing other digital events for now the first being the samuel blythe society on the 8th of may for those who are either already or considering a legacy to claire and then a whole week I think it's a week, if my math served me correctly, uh, a digital gala uh, between June and July. Dates are on the website, so hopefully see many of you there. But for now, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, and we will see you all again soon. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie.